lust and you have not, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain it. James is showing you the end result of lust. He's saying you will end up with the beast nature, you will end up with the murderous mind, and you will let nothing stand in your way. It, it is so overwhelming, it will so bring you down. You will end up killing. James is trying to show us here that lust is not just a weakness. It's not just something singularly you fight with, a little isolated battle that no one else is affected by. You say, well, this is my little world, it's my little problem, it's my sin. No one else is going to be bothered by it as long as I don't involve anybody else. No, it's not a weakness. It's not just your singular weak, uh, little inner struggle. No, God sees it as something more than that that affects so many, many other people. It finally ends up in these very fatal words. You will end up with a mindset of hatred, a mindset of murder. In other words, he's describing a mindset that says you will stop at nothing till you achieve it. You will stop at nothing. There'll come a time that the very thing that you believe could never happen in your life. I would never do that. How awful, how terrible, how shameful. That if there's lust in your heart that's not checked, if it is not stopped, if God does not heal it, if you play with it, if you flirt with it, you're going to end up one day doing the very thing that you once were ashamed of, that you could never conceive were possible because were possible to do because there is a dramatic downward pull to lust. What happens is that the addiction becomes deeper. With each step, there's an acceleration. There's a greater desire. There's less satisfaction than before. We become more and more wicked and evil in our thinking. There's a weakening of all moral backbone. And step by step, the mind becomes polluted. Sin becomes less hated than it was before. We become more comfortable with our sin until finally that lust is driving us as a hopeless victim. And we are overcome by it until it absolutely possesses us. And it ends up in death. And that's exactly what James is describing in lust. When lust conceives, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, what? Now, David opened this door of lust to hell one day. And just as James describes it, David became a killer. Now, if your spiritual sensibilities are shocked right now to think that you as a Christian, if you let your lust that you have right now in your heart go unchecked, and if it isn't stopped tonight, it's going to degenerate. It's got such a dramatic downward pull that it's going to possess you. Oh, there's not a homosexual that started out wanting to be a homosexual. There's never a murderer that started out to be a murderer. It's been a downward step after step, loss after loss of moral conviction. And if your sensibilities are stirred, thinking, how could you possibly even suggest that? I love the Lord. So did David, the mighty poet of God. This holy man, a man after God's own heart. If you would go to David and say, David, the day's coming that you're going to kill because of your lust. You're going to become a murderer. David would have been shocked. He said, never in a thousand years. You will find that the scripture says, and whithersoever David went, the Lord was with him and blessed him in everything he did. And the Bible says the very next verse that he judged Israel with righteous judgment. But three months later or so, just a few months later, David has allowed his lust to run away. David has allowed it to overcome him. David is running pell-mell down these steps to hell. On two occasions calls David a prophet. This man after God's heart, this, this one who at one time was so close to the Lord, so walking in righteousness, that his conscience smote him for just cutting a piece of Saul's garment. Remember when he went into the cave and cut off a piece of his garment? And then he, he, he went back and his heart smote him. He said, that's the anointed God. Why did I do such a horrible, abominable thing? Because you see, when you're walking in righteousness, you have that kind of discernment. You have that sensitivity to sin. You don't want to grieve God. You don't want to break his word. But look at David now. No, his heart's not smiting him. 
He's planning and he writes a note and says, put him in the front lines. In other words, kill him. Kill him. He said, Uriah is dead. And it didn't bother David until Nathan the prophet came and put a bony finger in his face and said, you're the man. You're the man. And I, I want to tell you something. That's the work of the Holy Ghost. To come to a meeting like this. Maybe you're here for the first time. Maybe you've heard the Holy Ghost talk to you about your sin time and time again. Nobody's waiting against your sin here. We're here to deliver. We're here to ask God by His Holy Spirit to convict you of your sin. But the work of the Holy Spirit through my preaching tonight is to be a knife. It's to be a finger. It's to be a finger. And says, out. You're the one. If you continue with it, there's a downward pull. And like David, the time will come. You'll lie and you'll cheat. You'll be treacherous against the Holy God to cover it up. You'll have murder in your heart. So you lost and you kill. If David's lust had not been stopped, if God did not put a stop to it, he heard this prophet of God and he melted before a holy God. He spent a week on his face fasting and praying. He wouldn't touch a drop of food. His heart was smitten because he said, I've sinned against God. And David repented. And that, that downward pull was thwarted. It was stopped by the Holy Spirit of God. But if, had, if David had not repented, if David had not returned, turned from his sins, I tell you, on authority of God's word, he would have been worse than Saul. He would have filled Jerusalem with blood from one end to the other. He would have murdered by the thousands, just like all the other corrupt kings of Israel did. And when you walk with God in holiness, you've heard Holy Ghost preaching. You've heard it coming loud and clear. And God's saying, lay it down, lay it down, lay it down. And you don't lay it down. The message finally is not heard. Your ears are closed. David opened his eyes. He opened his ears. He heard the conviction. I'm telling you tonight, I feel anointing and unction of the Holy Ghost tonight that God called some of you here tonight to deliver you from your lust before you damn your soul, before you're lost. Because you're already being magnetically pulled down. You're going faster and faster. The hole is getting stronger. He's not hiding from those who seek him. But he's hiding from those who toy with their lust. I'm not going to stay around while you toy and play with your lust, while you've had prophets point a finger at you. The Holy Ghost has dealt with you time and time again. You've had the word, you've hardened your heart time and time again, and you're on a free fall, and God's saying, stop now. Stop. God is saying, look, if you're going to play and toy with your lust, I'm not there. You seek me all you want, make all the noise, shout, talk in tongues, but I'm not there. There is a hiding of God. In, uh, prayer this past week it's just broken me up it was just that still small voice tell me what's on your heart oh jesus share with me so i can get up sunday night with the people and i can just let it flow and i'll know it's you jesus what is it that's grieving you about your children what's, what is it about me what is it about my family our staff the church what is it that grieves your heart lord and oh so clear david no one's really seeking me they're not seeking me you're not seeking me like you should. With all your heart. He said, seek me while I'm near. Seek me while I be found. God, God is saying something to the church right now. You'd better start seeking me, the Lord's saying, while I can be found. You better do it now. Because the time's going to come that you won't know where to go. You're not used to going to him. You're not used to seeking him. So used to calling a friend. So used to just sitting there in your despair. God says, learn to come to me. Seek me. And I, that's all I hear from God now. Seek me, David. Seek me. Every spare hour, seek me. Let him call you for that. He out through after my heart. My message this morning, doubt the sin God hates most. Amen. Doubt the sin God hates most. Go to Psalm 106, if you will, please. Psalm 106. Hello to all of our friends in the annex. Sorry you couldn't be in this place, but you get a bigger image than they do here. You, you can see us uh, three times bigger than they can on those screens. So God bless you. Delighted to have you. 
where you're visiting from all over the world. Psalm 106, verses 6 and 7, if you will, please. We have sinned with our fathers. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly. Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. Our fathers understood not, verse 7, our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the sea. And these words are, are powerful, even at the Red Sea. Lord, I thank you for the word. I thank you, Lord, for your power. And now, Lord, I need a special touch from you. Lord, there are people here that are visiting and there are people that have been coming to this church for quite a while and and a part of the body here. But Lord Jesus, we don't take your word for granted. We honor your word. We thank you for the word. It is life. It is our strength. It is our hope. Now, Lord, minister to, to me as I preach this. I need to hear this. Lord, don't let it just go through my mouth and through my heart without having a place and without affecting me eternally, I pray. Lord, help me to practice what I'm preaching this morning. Help me to live what I'm hearing from you in the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Doubt, the sin God hates the most. Of all sins, God makes it clear in the word, doubt is the most hated by the Lord. In fact, he said it grieves him. The Bible says that it gives him pain. And the Lord himself said it provokes him. If you want to provoke God, clearly this is the sin that provokes him the most. Now here in Psalm 106 and verse 5, we read, We have sinned, we've committed iniquity, we've done wickedly. Now what is this iniquity? What is this sin? What is this grieving of God? How did these people provoke him? Doubting God at the sea... Even at the Red Sea. And what the writer is saying, can you believe what happened here? Can you believe that in the face of one of the greatest miracles man has ever seen, the opening of the Red Sea, that God's people doubted him even in the face of that miracle? Can you believe the wickedness in us? Can you believe the, how we provoked Almighty God? He has just performed for us the greatest miracle we have ever seen or the world could have ever seen. It is one of the greatest miracles in the history of mankind. And even in the face of that, witnessing it, we doubted him. We mistrusted him. We provoked him. Now he's talking about the miracle that happened on the deliverance side. We provoked the Lord after witnessing the greatest miracle. Now we know what happened on the other side. Now I I, I preached a message here a number of years ago called Right Song, Wrong Side. They began to sing and dance on the victory side when all their enemies were drowned in the sea, when Pharaoh's army was gone. Yes, they could shout because they already had a good report. But they didn't shout. They didn't bless God and trust Him on the other side, on the testing side of the Red Sea. We know the terrible doubt that came. The Bible says they understood not the wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of His mercies. Now, it, it, it seems to me that when they witnessed these ten signs and wonders that God performed bringing judgment on Egypt, it's very clear that they thought that these were just natural happenstances, that these, this was just nature out of control. He said they didn't understand it at all. Even though Moses was trying to tell them this is the hand of God, he's going to deliver you through these miracles. They were called wonders by the prophets by, by the prophet Moses. But you know, these people didn't understand it. They took it for granted. This was just something of nature. Look at this people camped at the sea. The Lord led them into a situation and the, the place that he led them here to <clears throat> means, Peharoth means uh, the entrance to a precipitous cliff. It also means on the edge of a crisis. The edge of a crisis. That's the name of the place God led them to in Hebrew. He delivers them mightily. He delivers them with silver and with gold. They went out with silver and gold, the Bible said. They went out without a feeble person among them. There was supernatural power given to them. God had made all provisions for what was to take place. 
No, there were no grocery stores. There were no malls. There were no shopping centers. There were no guards. There were no wells. But God had a plan. Every contingency was planned for. God made provision. There was even a cloud to cover them in that hot sun, in the wilderness beating down in that hot sun. A cloud covering the whole camp. The cloud didn't cover just the tabernacle. It covered the whole camp. You could look out in the distance and you could see the sun blaring down. But here, they were under the shadow of that cloud the whole time. There was a fire at night, a fiery pillar. And that was to heat them because in the desert it got very cold at night. And it was also that comforting glow, the darkness of that wilderness being lit. God made provision. He knew where the water was. He knew how he was going to feed them. Angels' food falling from heaven. Every provision was made. They were no danger. There was no danger whatsoever. God had planned this, but he was going to test them. Folks, faith is not built on miracles. Faith is not founded on miracles. They saw ten great miracles, ten great signs and wonders, and wound up without an ounce of faith. Full of doubt and unbelief. Why is God taking this people out of Israel and putting them into a promised land? Now, the Bible says very clearly, and you remember the history of it, he said, this is the smallest nation, the most insignificant of all nations and people. They're just a small handful. And God chooses them. Now, why is he bringing them here to a testing place? And why is he going to take them into the land of Canaan? Is it because he just wants to give them new houses and he's got a special people he wants to just bless and they're going to inherit vineyards and milk and honey and they're going to be able to sit idle in pleasure? And they're going to just be able to sit there and praise and worship God and offer sacrifices from generation to generation. No, 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 no. You see, God loves the world, the Bible says. And God loved the world just as much then as he loves him now. As he loves the world now. He, those heathen nations, God was yearning after them. He yearned after them just as much. We, we think that only in the day of grace did God have love. No, God was love from the beginning. He loved the Canaanites. He loved all of those nations, even though they sinned. There was a heart of love for them. The Bible says that prophetically all the prophets knew that the law would go out from Jerusalem. That God was trying to raise up missionaries with a testimony. He was trying to build an army that he could use, that his truth could go out through the whole then known world. They were not going into Canaan land just for their own comfort. They weren't going to go there to so that all of the goodness and grace of God could be absorbed in themselves. Not at all. That's not why God saved you and that's not why He saved me. He didn't save us just to sit in this church and absorb all His glory and His grace and His goodness and His mercy. God is out always searching and looking for an army, looking for a people that are tested and tried and have proven Him faithful. Because it's not just going out and preaching an unproven gospel. If you don't, if you haven't proved the gospel, you can't believe the gospel you preach. I hear people talk about belonging to faith movements. But how can you be a faith preacher? How can you go to a faith church and not allow the testing to produce faith? God is trying to produce something in these people. God wanted them. They're standing on the brink of a catastrophe. They're standing on the brink of a disaster. A crisis like they've never known. You say, well, does God expect these people to, to trust Him when the army is coming down and everything looks impossible? God expects them to trust and believe him and not doubt their situation? Yes. Absolutely. For without faith it's impossible to please him. And they believe that come to him believe, must believe that he is, that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God is trying to produce a people with faith and confidence in him to become messengers, tested and tried. 
But you see, God can't do anything where there is no faith, where there is all doubt. God in flesh couldn't do it and wouldn't do it. Jesus couldn't do mighty miracles there because of their doubt and their unbelief. He rebuked the Red Sea, the Scripture says, in verses 9 and 12, 9 to 12, and it was dried up, and he saved them. He redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. Then believed they his words. Then sang they his praises. You see, you see after you get a good report, and after you've got victory, and after you've seen deliverance, anybody can sing. Be a fool if you didn't. I mean, you, 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 I can't understand how anybody wouldn't say, wonderful. I remember Debbie telling me when Roger, doctor called Roger, got the good word that the cancer hadn't spread to the spine, and Tiffany, I heard he yell, yes, yes, yes. Debbie said, what's going on? I had a good report. And we all do that. I, I'm going to tell you what I did when I heard it. There was a rejoicing in my heart. As you see, we're on the victory side. The Bible said, then they believed his words. The folks, these folks miserably failed because the very next verse reads, they soon forgot his works and waited not for his counsel. They despise the pleasant land. They believe not his word. Oh, folks, I believe God is still searching for that people. That people who will be his greatest evangelistic tool. You see, God's not looking for some highly educated seminarian to take the gospel to the world. He's not looking for mega churches with multiplied thousands of people who've never been tested and tried. Because those same people, I don't care if you have 50,000 in your church. Those people, if they've not been tested, if all, all they see is that, that everything is rosy and they can't see anything coming. Folks, when, when, people, when people ignore that and they don't look at reality, and then when the hard times come, when the testing times come, there are no resources, there's nothing to draw on. And God can't use that kind of a people to be a testimony to a lost world. Not at all. He's not looking for that. Gideon had called for the nation to come and fight the Midianites. And many thousands responded to his call. God said to Gideon, he said, The people that are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Now proclaim in their ears. Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him go home. Let him go home. We don't want to infect the whole crowd here. We don't want to infect this army. And, and got it down to 10,000. Lord said, still too many. Got it down finally to 300 tested men. God is not looking for some great, powerful religious organization. He's looking for individuals. He's looking for men and women of God who have been through the flood, who have been through the fire, who have been tested and have come through with faith, tested as gold, tried in the fire. I want to tell you, the world is looking. The world is watching for people like that. Not to just throw scriptures around. Not just trying to get everybody to come to their church. But coming on the job when everybody on that job knows that you're going through the trial of your life. You're facing calamity. You're going to work even though you, you, you are broken and you have a heart that can, you can hardly stand the day. There's, you've been rocked by hard times. And the world is watching you. Just as King Darius was watching Daniel. You remember the story. Daniel's a man of prayer and he's one of three presidents and the other two got jealous of him because of God's favor on his life. And they figured out where the favor came from because he prayed so much. So they went to Darius and they flattered him and, and deluded him into signing a 30-day ban on prayer. 
Anyone who prays for the next 30 days to anybody but the king goes to the lion's den. And you can be sure that those men in those 30 days didn't feed those lions. They're going to feed Daniel to those lions. And they will make sure they were deathly hungry. The king signs it. Not knowing about his giving a death sentence to Daniel. He tried desperately to save him. But the kings and the presidents and the whole government staff at that time came to him and said, it's the law of the Medes and Persons, you can't change it. He did everything with his power to try to change it. They found Daniel praying. They brought him to the king. And just before he was cast into the lion's den, here is what King Darius said, Daniel, thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver you. He's going to deliver you. Because you've served him faithfully, he's going to deliver you. Folks, the Bible said the king went to his palace and fasted all night. He didn't sleep that night. Don't tell me the world isn't watching. Don't tell me they don't have their eyes on God's people who have boasted of the glory and power of God. You tell the world who Jesus is. You tell them that he's your savior and your healer. You tell them your God can do the impossible and now you're in an impossible situation and Darius has believed him. He said, I believe your God's going to deliver you. God's going to deliver you. Now folks, he didn't deliver him out of the lion's den. He delivered him in the lion's den. The king went to his palace and passed the night fasting, the scripture says. I read in Psalms 31, 19. Oh, how great is thy goodness which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of man. He said, you trust in me before the sons of man. I've laid up something good for you. And what is that good thing that he's laid up? I believe it's an impeachable, glorious testimony to the world. How through the power of the Holy Spirit and through coming into the rest of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you can survive any situation, and you can come through it as a testimony, having a testimony to the whole world, not just preaching, but having lived it. So Daniel goes into the lion's den. Don't tell me, don't try to tell me he slept all night. He f- Watched and prayed all night is what he did. These lions were hungry. I'm sure they roared. I'm sure they yawned and opened their mouth and he saw the teeth. And I bet he quoted scripture all night. <laughs> I couldn't relate to a man who could go into that and sleep all night. That's not, that's not human nature when you're face to face with crisis. That's not, the, that's not the nature man. And God doesn't expect you to be unnatural and be some kind of a superman or superwoman trying to brace yourself so you don't have to cry when a crisis comes in. You don't have to uh, give vent to the human nature and the feelings. Those things are natural. They come out. Boy, the, early in the morning, Darius gets up and runs to the di- lion's den. And the Bible said he cried with a lament, lamentable, that's mean a sorrowful, grieving voice. Daniel! Servant of the living God, is thy God whom you serve continually able to deliver you from the lion's den? You're still alive, Daniel! And out comes a voice from the lion's den. King Darius, live forever! My God has sent his angel. He shut the lion's mouth. They have not hurt me. They have not hurt me. Folks, this is still the question of the day. Is your God able? Is your God able to sustain you in hard times? That's the cry of human nature. And folks, if you want to know what the world is looking at, Darius is the example. He's looking for... In fact, he says, because one man was faithful... One man believed God through his trial. One man held fast to his faith. 
The scripture said no man of hurt was found upon him because he believed in his God. And because of that, the whole world was impacted. The world was impacted. Darius extolled the God. In fact, Daniel 6, you've got to see it. Daniel 6. Let me show you what happens when, when you hold your faith. Don't doubt God in your difficult times. You don't know it, but I'm preaching to myself. And maybe you figured it out. Chapter 6. Verse 25, beginning to read. Then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he's the living God and steadfast forever. And his kingdom that which, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall be even unto the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and earth. Now folks, look at me. Yes, he sees God as a God of heaven and earth doing signs and wonders in the heaven, but that's not really what impacted him. The impact was that one man, in the next word it says, who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. This was the testimony. He had to see one man. He had to see one believer who really believed what he preached. Could really come to a place in God where he could face any situation, any trial without bending, without breaking. See, God's ultimate desire for all of us as his children is that we come into a perfect rest in him. A perfect rest in him. Now, I'm going to tell you something. There is a place in Christ, and I want you to listen closely now. There is a place in the Lord where there's no anxiety about the future. There's a place of rest where there's no fear of sudden calamity, no fear of afflictions, no fear of falling, no fear of man, no fear of unemployment, no fear of losing property, no fear of losing health, a place of total confidence in God's faithfulness. There is a place. This place is shown in Hebrews 3 and 4, or 4 and 5, and I'm going to take you to it in just a minute. But folks, when, when the Lord says there was a rest offered to the children of Israel and they refused it because of their unbelief, and he said there still remains this place. If they had entered in, he would not be offering it now. It would have all been completed. We would have been able to follow them in, but he said they didn't go in. And I'm still looking, I'm still searching for people to come into the rest. Now, this rest is a promise, the Bible says. It's a promise. It's something you can't work up. You, you, you have to lay down your own works, and those own works are those works of trying to steal yourself, waiting for the next uh, shoe to fall, so to speak. The New Age people call it nirvana. And they said the only way that you can steel yourself and brace yourself for tragedies that are coming in the future, the only way you can do it is to harden your heart. The only way you can do it is to kill your love. In other words, if you destroy the love for your son or daughter, you can't be hurt. If you learn to hate yourself, even, it comes to this where, where I, don't, I don't care whether I live or die, Nothing matters. Just trying to bring myself into a place where I am stupefied. That's not what the Bible's talking about. The Bible's not talking about that at all. It's not talking about bracing yourself. It's not trying to come into some mindset that you say, this is not going to bother me, and you grit your teeth. No! This is a divine rest that comes by the hand of the Holy Ghost to those who believe God who see it and say, I'm going after that. Folks, when I read this, every time I've read it, ever since I was called to preach, ever since I've been reading this Bible, every 
time I read, there remaineth yet a rest of the children of God. That rest where we have complete confidence in the Lord. That he does all things well. He's a loving heavenly father and he would never hurt one of his children. I'm a father of four children, 11 grandchildren. I can tell you there's never been one moment, never a thought in my mind to do anything but good for my children. Never have I conceived that I could stand by when they hurt without entering into their suffering and doing everything with my power to heal and deliver. And there remains a rest yet for the children of God. Hebrews 4, 9. A place in Him in which you're prepared for whatever may come. If you're in this rest, you don't panic when you're suddenly hit with unexpected crisis. You won't fall apart. Yes, you'll cry, you'll hurt, you do all of For we which do believe enter into rest. You go into rest by simple childlike faith. When you make a commitment to believe God and not doubt Him in any situation, there has to come a time when all the whys, why God, are gone. Until all those questions are gone, you say, I have a loving Father. I stand here and rest, boasting only in the Word of God and in His Holy Spirit that He's been faithful to give rest and peace to my soul. For he that has entered into his rest has also ceased from his own works as God did from his. In other words, you're not trying to be brave in the face of trouble. You're not trying to pump up some phony acceptance of your trial. No more worry about whether you're going to have strength to endure. Oh, folks, don't worry about whether when hard times come, you're being tested, whether you're going to faint or you're going to stand. Don't worry about that. Let me tell you before I close. Let me tell you why I seek God every day diligently in prayer. Let me tell you why I'm into this book every day devouring it. Let me tell you why I fast regularly. Not because... I have to preach in this pulpit. Not because I'm a minister called to preach. It's not only for fellowship. It's not only for getting to know his ways. It's beyond that. The reason I go into this book, the reason I seek him, in spite of all the victories and deliverance I've seen, and the peace and the rest that he's given to me, I know there's a warfare. I know there's a battle. And I know the devil's not going to let go. He's not going to rest as long as I'm seeking God. Now, if I quit seeking God, he'll give me peace. Probably let me alone. But if you're going to seek God, you're going to go all the way with the Lord. You're going to be tested. You're going to be tried. You're going to be in a warfare until the day you die. He's going to test and test until you, when you stand before Jesus, you're going to shine. Your faith is going to shine like gold. More precious than gold. But the reason... I do it because I want to be a prepared soldier. I know, I know, I know that you don't win the battle on the battlefield. I know that you don't go in unprepared. If, if, you're, if you're just a soldier and you haven't been to boot camp and you haven't been tested and tried, if you haven't been put through it, and the enemy suddenly pounces on you, you're not ready. There's no ammunition backup. There's no soldiers behind you. You're all alone there because you are not prepared. I go into this book and that's why it's important after every victory that you see in your life. That's the time to press in and get ready. (coughs) Folks, every good report I hear, I go to my face before God. And so, God, I know that when I'm praying... I know that when I'm in your word, I know that when I'm fasting, you're giving me spiritual authority over the power of the enemy. And I know that you're building up a reserve, reservoir in me of confidence in you. I'm getting to know your ways. I'm getting to know who you are and how you act and what you do. I'm getting to know you. Now, I may not feel 
that I am learning anything. I may not feel that spiritual power. I may not see that reservoir. But folks, the next time the enemy comes, the next time I'm in a crisis, the next time I face a calamity, I'm going to have reserves. I'm going to have resources I can draw on because I have won the battle alone with God. If you don't get anything else out of this mission, I'm going to close in just a moment. If you don't get anything else, I'm telling you, you may be sitting here now and you say, Brother Wilson, I am so grateful, I'm so thankful that as I sit here, I, my bills are paid, I, I, God's blessed me and I have no tragedy, I have no sickness, no illness in my family, everything's fine. That's the time. Not that you anticipate anything coming, not at all. God doesn't take everybody the same route. Not at all. I've known Christians that have had years and years and years. Their, their trials have been of a different nature. Trials have been like the dryness we hear. And there, there are many other ways that God can test us. But you never have to fear that God's going to lay his hand on one of your kids. And do anything to that child... Is not according to his mind and his will. He's not going to touch your husband or wife. He's not going to throw you out of your job and leave you without resources. He's not going to abandon you. And no matter whatever comes, please don't tell me that you're making a commitment to faith unless you're also making three other commitments. A commitment to this word daily. A commitment to your knees so that you're not in situational faith at all, but you're developing a relationship. It's a relationship faith. And also, you've come to understand how much God loves you. The absolute love of God. Folks, if I didn't know He loved me, I couldn't handle anything. I am so convinced of his love. And you know how I'm convinced of his love? On my knees and in this book. I read of his love. And then the Holy Spirit reveals it to me in the secret closet of prayer. And then when I'm fasting, oh, the Spirit of God comes on me. The Spirit of God comes on the church when it fasts. The Spirit of God comes on individuals. And, and when, when you fast in, in January, and I just have to say this, when you're fasting in January, this church is fasting and praying, God is going to come upon you as an individual, then suddenly, corporately, upon the whole body, the fire of the Holy Ghost, with confidence and with faith. Hallelujah. That we have a high priest who's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Glory be to God. Don't you know that God, through Jesus Christ, our high priest, is right now touched with everything you're going through. That could stand an amen. amen. If you really believe it, will you stand? <laughs> Folks, listen to me, please. Not everybody in this church today has been moving in faith. I will tell you, something I've learned in my 50 years of preaching, something I've learned, <clears throat> that God doesn't waste His Word. He had a reason for bringing this. And He wants to get at the doubt in you lovingly and pluck it out. Because he says, I've been trying to do a work in you and for you, but I can't do it because of your unbelief and your doubt. I'm going to give an altar call now for everyone, balcony and the main floor. Doubts have crept in. Some fear has crept in because wherever there's doubt, fear is going to trail right in. Doubt and fear are twins. And if you've been doubting God, maybe you've been praying for something and you haven't seen it happen, but a fear has gotten a hold of you. Some of you that had cancer, 
and that fear of coming back. I would even pray for Debbie and Roger that if there was any fear of that cancer returning, God remove that fear. And God remove all fear from our hearts today so that tomorrow, Christmas, and the rest of this day, you can rejoice in the faithfulness of the Lord and come into that rest by faith. Step out of your seat and come here. And we're going to pray and we're going to take authority over that in Jesus' name and believe the Lord. Up in the balcony, go to the stairs on either side and come down. Anyhow. And in the annex, I want you to just go forward and stand between the screens. Please don't block the screens, but I'll pray for you. But I'd like you to step out just as a testimony. I want to walk in faith before God. I want to believe God to allow him to work. I don't want to bind the Lord in my life and my home for my unbelief. If you have an unsaved husband or wife or family members, an unbelief or fear has gotten hold of your heart concerning it, I want you to move out. If you're not right with God, if you're not saved, if you don't believe the Lord or you're backslidden and you've run from God, come follow these that are coming right now. Move in close, make room for those that are coming. And from the 121st Psalm, my help comes from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. He will not slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. He's your shade upon the right hand. The sun will not smite thee by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He's preserved thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth even forevermore. God said, I'm your keeper. I'm your preserver. I'll keep you. I'll preserve you. Trust me. Yes, trust me before the sons of men. Let me sum up everything I've said. He's looking for those who will trust him before the sons of men. Trusting him on the job. Trusting him before your family. Trusting him before all the powers of hell. Say, God, I trust you. And before all the witnesses and glory in heaven. Lord, help me to trust you. Help my unbelief. Pray this prayer with me right now. Jesus, I pray this prayer. Help my unbelief. Take away my doubts. Dissolve my fears. I want to be a man or woman. I want to be a person of trust. I want to trust you in everything that I face. Give me grace, Lord. Give me peace. You didn't give me the spirit of fear. But love, and power, a sound mind. Thank you, Jesus, that you love me. You care about me. So help me to cast all my cares upon you now. I love you, Jesus. I praise you. You're faithful. You're loving, Father. And you love me. And I receive your love. I want you to raise your hands now while I pray for you. And in the annex, raise your hands. Heavenly Father, we come as a body to you now, and I pray for everyone with raised hands that you would remove from our hearts all doubt and fear and trembling. And Lord Jesus, let us come into that rest that you said still is offered to your people. And Lord, all we can do is come by simple childlike faith, not try to figure you out, not try to figure out what's coming, not try to figure out what we're in, and just rest and say, God, you're going to see me through. You'll see my family through. You're going to be faithful because you are a loving God. Whenever I need you, Lord, even though I have to go into life,